Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Devraj, uh, one of the chief resident child neurology. Uh, me and my co-chief resident, Nuratulai Uke, okay. uh, we welcome everyone from Downstate Medical Center, also from Kings County, Maimonides, Rutgers, uh, LIJ, and also from the Palmville Cornell University. Uh, today's our speaker is uh, from our own institute at Downstate Medical Center, Dr. Kohler. Uh, Dr. Kohler is a director of the hand and microsurgery uh, and assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Downstate Kings County and Maimonides Medical Center. He's a consultant at the One Brooklyn Health uh, Hospital, which is Kingsbrook Interfaith in Brookdale. And he's a board, board certified orthopedic surgery by, the, he did board certified, he's board certified in the orthopedic surgery by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery with an additional subspeciality in the hand surgery. Uh, and he's a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon. He uh, has particular interest in treatment of uh, upper extremity in adults and children, uh, especially congenital disorder, peripheral nerve surgery, uh, brachial plexus, and upper limb reconstruction and re uh, Dr. Kohler is uh, not only nationally, but he's internationally recognized, I would say, because he also actually uh, Travel to Honduras as a member of Touching Hand Project and teaches orthopedic surgery training in Kumasi, Ghana, and the hospitals in the Kenya. He's like a frequent visiting professor there. Uh, at Downstate, uh, he has an active lab uh, which is focusing on translational peripheral nerve repair and regeneration. And uh, he actually published uh, more than 50 clinical and basic science research papers. Uh, he also contributed a chapter for the multiple textbooks. And he uh, presented national and uh, international meeting uh, more than 200 uh, lectures or presentation. So once again, I welcome Dr. Fowler and uh, we'll take over now. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, so it's a pleasure to uh, speak with all of you across the city today on a uh, topic that is um, near and dear to my heart and I'm quite passionate about, which is neonatal brachial plexus injuries. Um, and I wanted uh, to take the opportunity to um, share with you um, my um, uh, thoughts on this and 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 hopefully provide some enlightenment into where we are um, in 2021 in treating these kids and where we are not and 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 how we are lacking so well uh, this is my typical uh, OR experience with these kids and 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 we'll kind of walk through this so I think the, the first thing to, to emphasize is that this is really a, an underappreciated and undertreated problem um, in, in the United States. Um, and uh, um, that's something that I'm going to, to talk a lot about as we continue through this morning's discussion. So I do want to, I know there's a uh, myriad of people in different um, areas of training and experience um, on the call. So I will talk a little bit about um, some of the injury and the background behind it, because I think it's important to provide context for, for what we do. So the incidence is actually fairly high. It's around, it's up to five out of every thousand live births, depending on the article you look at. And just to put that in a frame of reference, New York City, right, had uh, 120,000 live births last year. And that means that there's around six to 700 kids potentially with a brachial plexus uh, uh, palsy um, who were born last year. And the question is, where are they? Who's treating them? What's happened to them? The risk factors are readily identified. And I think it's kind of something we all know even from medical school, shoulder dystocia, maternal diabetes and high birth weight. But there's a falsehood that's continuing to be perpetuated, I think, and um, it's not borne out in the literature, that advancements in modern neonatal and obstetric care, including doing C-sections, has not decreased the incidence of plexopathy in these infants. And there's another common misconception that these kids all recover and do well. Herb's palsy, don't worry, it'll get better. And the reality is, even if they have 
a good recovery, they're going to have persisting disability. And that's something that I'm going to talk a lot about um, towards the end of this. So unfortunately the plexus doesn't look like this, although it'd be pretty awesome if it did, um, but it does look similar. And, uh, and, and as you all know, it's divided into, into five zones. And so we're gonna talk a lot about um, uh, the root uh, level injuries uh, today, because that's really what you're seeing uh, in the pediatric population. Uh, unlike the adults where I might have someone, you know, stabbed in the brachial plexus, for instance, who I'm operating on Tuesday next week, um, and, and they have cord level injuries. So as you know, um, I think you're all very familiar with the proximal anatomy. Um, I wanna remind you that, you know, the sensory bodies are residing in the, the dorsal root ganglia, but the motor cell bodies are still in the spinal cord and that the nerve root epineurium is confluent with the dura. So that when you uh, image these injuries, you can see these pseudo meningocele's from the uh, rupture uh, of, the, of the dura there. And here's a good MRI example of that. So the anatomy um, functionally, while it's five zones, we break it up functionally from a surgical perspective into supraclavicular anatomy here, where you can see that the anterior scalene has been retracted and the middle scalene is, is um, uh, in view with the five roots exiting uh, between them in the posterior cervical triangle. Uh, and then moving to the infraclavicular view um, below the clavicle, um, where they're intimately um, associated with the axillary artery and, uh, and vein. Uh, and then moving into the medial arm, um, which continues to still be part of the plexus, um, where you're having your terminal branches. It's also important to keep in mind that there are anatomic variations to the plexus. It's not as netters always drew it. Um, you can have a prefixed plexus with C4 contributions and you can have a postfixed uh, plexus with T2 contributions. And it's, in, it's important to have a um, flexibility of the framework of your mind when you're seeing these kids. Now, the anatomy matters a lot. <clears throat> so when you look at these injuries, what you typically see is with the lower nerve roots, you see ruptures. And why is that? So I want you to look at A and B. The way the anatomy is formed as the roots exit, they enter into these shoots and there's good bony morphology. And in the lower nerve roots, this is um, less uh, developed. And so what you get is you get ruptures where they're actually um, no, not, they're actually avulsions from the spinal cord because of that. But in the upper roots, like C5 and C6, typically these tend to be more postganglionic because of more well-defined defined shoots and bony morphology that they're going through. And so you tend not to have avulsions but they're ruptured postganglionic. And, and that's a really important thing uh, to understand because it bears out that C5 typically is not evulsed and that changes the management. So this is typically what most people learn, right? Is a sudden classification for nerve injuries, neuropraxia, axonotomesis, neurotomesis. Um, and sometimes that's even uh, further broken down into the Sunderland classification. But it, it really doesn't help you think about this um, in reality, because in reality, it's degree of injuries, right? Using those terms are really flawed and sort of an oversimplification. And you really need to think about what's happening on a microscopic level. So I think a better way to think about it and how I think about it is what's the percent of exotomy that I have, so intact versus non-intact axons, what's the percent of demyelination that I have happening of my intact axons, and how much of my macro and microstructure is intact? Because what you see is that if you have mostly a demyelination event, then it's possible to have complete recovery. But if you have too much exotomy, 
then recovery starts to be uncertain. And then you can start as your strain increases, right? As you come closer to having that rupture, then you can end up in that neurotumesis area. And so there's not really boxes and classific and that you can put patients into, but it's a spectrum. And remyelination is, is an important thing to think about. And that's what we really see in the beginning of a lot of these, right? Is that because myelin's so sensitive to stretch that you're, you're having a demyelination and then a remyelination. And remyelination should happen and be complete by about two months. And that's an important time frame to keep in mind, okay? Is that two month time frame for remyelination. And when you're recovering from axotomy, when you have an axon that's ruptured, what happens? Well, at first, nothing, right? There's minimal function. And then we talk about Wallerian degeneration, but then you start to see um, motor unit expansion. So one axon actually innervates hundreds of muscle fibers. When you do a needle EMG, you're measuring maybe four to five muscle fibers. So you're not even coming close to understanding the full breadth of what the axon's doing. And so when you have that Wallerian degeneration, what happens? Well, the body doesn't just sit by idly and do nothing. In fact, what happens is you get presynaptic Schwann cells searching for viable axons around next to that denervated muscle fiber, right? So you get this kind of outsprouting and that's what happens those guide an outsprouting from adjacent neuromuscular junctions to re innervate that. So when you see early re innervation, it's not happening from the D from the, the um, axotomy that's happened. It's not happening from the axonotomesis. It's happening from the nearby neuromuscular junctions. And, and that is proportional to distance and, and age and strength recovering, but that's why you see that recover kind of ahead of time. And, and what you start to realize is that each one of those, those axons, each one of those neuromuscular junctions can innervate up to five times what they typically do. So in children, a lot of the times we may see that happening. Um, so that expansion of intact axons to that nodal sprouting takes about two to three months also. So by four to five months after an axotomy, you can have an 80% recovery, but it's not an 80% recovery from the axon that has been ruptured. It's from the adjacent ones. And that's important to understand. Probably the, one of the most frequently used classifications of neonatal plex, uh, plexus injuries is the Naracus classification. And, and it's used because it breaks it down into um, very simplified um, common presentations with a rate of recovery that's likely. And um, this falls into grow, going to just C5, C6, 6, 7, complete plexopathy and plexopathy with a, a flail arm with the horners. Um, I want to point out that we're going to talk a little bit about that rates of recovery and what that actually means, but you can't grade them until about four, two to four weeks after birth because neuropraxia needs to have an opportunity to recover. Um, but, but let's talk about this a little more. So this is classifying by anatomic location. All right. So the way to think about it. So a Naracus one, that's really an upper trunk. It's an herbs palsy. It's what everybody knows. Okay. It's most common C5, you know, C5, C6. 50% of all plexopathies present with this, okay? You're gonna see elbow dysfunction and you may see some wrist dysfunction, all right? And certainly shoulder dysfunction. So most people think about it as a shoulder elbow problem, but there is some wrist in there. And extended herbs is a better way to think about a Naracus too, okay? It's an herbs palsy with a little extra. What's that little extra? Well, C7 got involved and C7 is an interesting, strange nerve root. Um, when C7 gets involved, now the lower subscap's involved. So subscap has um, innervations from C5 to C7, remember, and, it, and it's, um, it's actually um, different between the upper and lower subscap. Um, you start to get more shoulder dysfunction and you start to um, move into the hand a little bit. Now a pan plexus injury, that's the next most common, it's about 20% present with a, a, a pan plexopathy. And, I wanna point out, just remember that if 
it's accompanied with a Horner syndrome. They're not recovering at 0%. It's a Naraka score, worst outcomes, right? And even if they are presenting without a Horner's, it's still not good. Um, and then everybody talks about clunkies, which is a CAT1. It's so rare. It's unbelievably rare. I've never seen one and I've done a lot of plexus. Um, and it's almost always accompanied by Horner's and it has a very poor outcome as well. So part of the issue is that there's a misconception of natural history. Many come, have come to believe that neonatoplexopathy recovers spontaneously. Don't worry about referring them. But the issue is not just what you see as a neuro neurological recovery, but there's also contractures, joint subluxation, and a functional recovery that is less appreciated. Because in reality, if you really look at the numbers and the, and the papers, only about 32% of children actually make a quote unquote full recovery. And those kids are the ones that have rapid recovery of their deltoid and their biceps by about two months. So early elbow flexion recovery is not necessarily the criterion to recommend against surgery. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. The other thing that I alluded to, but I just wanna talk, just mention, is that modern OB care and neonatal care has not changed incidence and prevalence. Many times people assume that the inciting event happened in that second stage of labor, labor the shoulder dystocia, how are we extracting the shoulder from here? But there is evidence to support that there could be some in utero or occurrence prior to labor, that the intrapartum event um, happened prior to delivering that shoulder, that it may have been due to endogenous forces you know, during the first stage of labor. So we don't know the answer to that, but I, I I, I, if you notice what I haven't put in here is I have not called this a birth brachial plexus, uh, birth brachial palsy, right? Terminology matters, especially in the legal world that we have to live in. Um, nor do I call this a congenital um, brachial plexopathy. Um, this is neonatal. It happens sometime in the neonatal period. Um, where to place the blame? there's evidence to support a multiple factors. So is there a role for electrodiagnostic studies in working up these infants? I don't think so. Certainly not for routine where they present, as I just said. And why is that? Well, first off, it's hard, okay? I'm sure you've all tried. It's hard to get um, uh, to perform this, even with experienced people. And the needle EMGs in infants, which is what I find to be most useful, um, usually tends to be overly optimistic. So it's interesting. In papers where they found active motor units, but then explored, there's com and there might be complete paralysis. Sometimes people think that the small size of the muscle fibers allows for kind of an overestimation of voluntary units. But the other thing is remember that in the utero period, there's a polyneuronal innervation. And that switches to a mononeuronal innervation after birth. And there are some people that hypothesize that potentially that's not always fully replaced when we're measuring them in the neonatal period. And so we're getting false results. So most people recommend against the electrodiagnostic studies in these infants because it tends to result in an underappreciation of the injury and an overestimation of their potential for recovery. But what about radiographic assessment? There is a role here. Certainly routine clavicle and humerus films as indicated by their physical exam is important. Sometimes fractures can masquerade as a plexopathy, but they just are in pain from broken bones. Um, routine MRI, I don't do. I usually reserve it for the pre-op patient and I do, uh, do get it. Um, it's important to make sure, like in this case, you haven't missed a spinal cord tumor or a, say, hemangioma, um, you know, or a central lesion. So there, there is a role for that in the workup. Um, I always get a chest x-ray. I am curious to see what the status of their diaphragm is, their phrenic nerve. So here you can see a hemidiaphragmatic elevation. Um, I always get that MRI that I talked about. Ultrasound is great in theory, wonderful in theory super hard to put into practice. Like it's a great idea to say, oh, why can't we ultrasound the plexus? 
um, very difficult and challenging and hasn't been borne out to actually be something that's successful. I don't think there's a role for CT or CT myelogram anymore with modern uh, MRI techniques. But let's talk a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish with the MRI, because I think that's another area of, of misconception. First off, the MRI is to exclude other things, intraspinal nerve lesions and central problems. Sometimes it's to try and see if you can see a, a nerve root avulsion um, and, and a pseudomeningocele. Um, and, and I only get a C-spine uh, MRI. There really is no role for extra foraminal MRI. So no role in ordering a brachial plexus MRI. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> we can't tell the difference between scar edema and aroma in babies. There's lots of perineural fibrosis in them and you just can't differentiate. And modern magnetic resonance neurography, um, which has been useful in adults and larger uh, nerves like the femoral nerve and the sciatic nerve can't be applied to the small role in babies, uh, small nerves in babies. And, and so it doesn't influence my decision to have, do surgery or not or how to treat these children. So I don't get it at all. So C-spine MRI, yes, but brachial plexus MRI, there's no role for them. And remember, these kids need sedation. So we're not talking about a, a, um, a test where there's no risk to it. So who gets surgery then? Well, it's indicated on physical exam. And that means we need to be very precise with our physical examination. So what do we examine? Well, it's hard to examine babies. Um, and I think there's three functions that are critically important. And that's understanding the biceps, wrist extension, and finger function, because those are three things we can fairly reliably study. So why the biceps in particular? And I remember, I didn't say elbow flexion. I said the biceps, because brachioradialis can flex the elbow. So the biceps is a pure root, upper roots, right? It can be isolated and it can be studied individually. So you place the baby there, you place your finger on the biceps and you get them to flex up and you can feel the contraction of the biceps and you can see their elbow flexion against gravity. Wrist extension, you can also get the babies to do, right? By trying to give them keys or you know, things that they might want. And hand function is important because that's going to determine the extent of the lesion, right? Do we have a panplexopathy here? C7 is always hard to examine in particular, and I kind of alluded to that before. So here on the left is a child with no wrist extension at four months, yet on exploration, C7 was normal. And on the right, wrist extension is present at three months, but C7 was a vulse on exploration. So we're not looking at C7 with that but we're, it is important to understand wrist and hand function. We can look at that. So controversies, right? Should we operate? When should we do it? And what should we do? So the first thing is, well, should surgery be performed? And that depends on who's saying what's a good result. Because a good result might be different for the surgeon, the neurologist, the therapist, the patient, and the parent. For me, I rely on biceps recovery as my marker. And I think there's good evidence to support that um, based as far back as the 70s with Malaysia, and then in this Peter Waters paper where they looked at recovery of biceps function in patients that um, um, had that occur before three months versus after three months and had surgery, that if you have recovery of the biceps before three months, those kids are going to do well. But if they have recovery of their biceps at months four, five, and six, they were better off having surgery. A lot of people use the active movement scale that came out of sick children's in Toronto. Um, I don't, I use biceps function. Why is that? Well, because they're measuring elbow flexion, not biceps function. And so I think you're missing children with this. Clark popularized um, the cookie test, which I'm sure you've heard about, which is you're watching these kids and looking at how they evaluate. And if they're having progress, you keep watching them. And at nine months you say, okay, let's see if they can bring a cookie to their mouth. But there's issues with the cookie test because the cookie test needs not just elbow flexion, but it needs shoulder external rotation to get the cookie to the mouth. So you're not just testing the biceps. And so what could you be missing? Well, you could be missing the fact that these kids are becoming dysplastic while they're having neurological recovery. So 
we know that kids with herbs and upper herbs and all the other ones, they develop posterior shoulder dislocations and subluxations because of imbalance. And they develop this glunohumeral dysplasia. And this is a three month ultrasound showing it present in herbs. And ultrasound, by the way, for this is wonderful. And so we have this glenohumeral deformity that happens. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this because I think this is something that's important. The other issue is that we rely on papers kind of perpetuating and citing themselves and perpetuating falsehoods. This is a problem in the medical literature across the board, right? Where you have people cite somebody else who cited somebody else and it's a game of telephone. And when you actually dive in and look at all the studies, the ones that are often cited to have excellent prognosis with these injuries are not good papers. And the few studies that are good suggest that spontaneous recovery is actually worse than what we think. And in these grain in reviews and textbooks, we're overestimating how these kids do. So when should surgery be done? So if their hand's not working or they have a flail arm, they need surgery. If the biceps doesn't recover by three months, they need surgery. If there's any doubt in recovery of their motion, or if you can't go to get exam by before six months, they need surgery. So for me, I operate on herbs and extended herbs at three months, flail arm with no horners at three months. And if they have a horner syndrome with a flail arm, they need surgery at six weeks. That's been borne out in the literature to try and get them the best opportunity at having function. But across the board, before six months. And is there a difference between three and six months? Yes, there is. Because if you operate on these kids earlier, they will have less future operations in their life. But if you wait four to six months, they're gonna have more operations. Why is that? We're gonna talk about it, but it's because of glenohumeral dysplasia. So the issue here is that, you know, either we're not getting them referred in a timely manner or the examination is not precise. So if it's not precise, wait another month, but don't wait six months. As a side note, I also always do intraoperative nerve testing. And one of the things that I would also like to just point out here is, you know, sometimes we have neuromas and continuity in these kids. And so people say, well, we don't want to operate on them because it might not be ruptured or they might not have an avulsion. It might be a neuroma and continuity and they'll be fine. Well, guess what? They do better if they're neuralized than if we just leave them. And this paper um, uh, out of, uh, you know, Minnesota um, really supports that. Um, so what are my current treatment algorithms? So herbs, in my experience, I've found with an herbs palsy that nerve transfers have become superior to grafting. There are benefits. I don't have to harvest the kid's sural nerves. I can bypass the area of injury and a nerve transfer. I'm doing the surgery closer to where the neuromuscular junction is. So I'm having faster reinnervation, faster recovery, and it's a faster surgery, to be honest. Um, and so... <clears throat> The long-term comparison studies have yet to be done, but the short-term studies look very positively. And you still need to look and confirm that you have an herbs though. So you still have to do an intra-op examination of the supraclavicular plexus. So I perform what's called a quad transfer. So I do a double fascicular transfer for elbow flexion that's called a double overland. So I take uh, a fascicle of the median nerve to the biceps branch of the muscle cutaneous, a fascicle of the ulnar nerve to the brachialis branch of the muscle cutaneous, then personally, what I do is I like to use a medial pectoral nerve to the axillary nerve, so I don't have to flip the kid prone or do a second operation. And I do a spinal accessory nerve to the suprascapular nerve. So here's examples of that. So here's a child with a the spinal accessory to the suprascapular nerve. Um, you can see that's my supra, um, suprascapular uh, exposure and approach. You can see the identification of the two nerves there in the middle window, and then the uh, neurography in the, uh, on the right-hand side for that nerve transfer. Uh, medial pectoral nerve to axillary nerve. Um, this is an infra, uh, um, infraclavicular approach and identification of the medial pectoral nerve and the axillary nerve, and then that neurography happening on the um, uh, right-hand side. And then here's an example of the double overland that happens in the medial arm. So we're, we're doing the nerve transfer right at the biceps, right where we need the magic to happen. Um, and here's an example of a different child um, who is, uh, had surgery at uh, three months and the child's now 10 months old. 
and you can see, look on that left-hand side, you can see the external rotation um, that was present there, the shoulder abduction that she's maintaining it and holding it. And uh, go ahead, go ahead, show that elbow flexion off. Ah, oh, there we go. Look at that elbow flexion. These quad nerve transfers give just spectacular results and I've been immensely happy with them. What about an extended herbs? It's weird. It's interesting in that extended herbs, um, you can do the distal nerve transfers to restore function, but grafting paradoxically tends to work better instead of a nerve transfer for the radial nerve function, that C7 component of it. So I will often graft that and do my nerve transfers. Here's an example of sural nerve cable grafting. What about a flail arm? So remember I said it before, if they have a Horner's, they need surgery at six weeks old. This is complicated intra-op decision-making. I'm not gonna get into this because this is really, that's more of a surgical talk and, and a discussion of, of being prepared to do everything. Um, but uh, if you wanna talk about that in the future, we could always talk about it, but there's no question, mandatory surgery um, for all these kids and, um, and what we do gets, gets uh, complicated. So what if I see recovery at six months? What then? Like I waited all this time, I saw recovery at six months. Well, you know, I think it's a trap because we know that spontaneous recovery after three to four months is inferior to surgery, number one. And now we have a psychological problem. Now I have a physician who's saying, oh, I'm seeing recovery. I have a parent who wants desperately for hope, right? And they're seeing recovery happening. So even if it's non-significant, it's now become a much harder decision to make the decision to proceed with surgery in these parents' babies, because it's hard to say, but there's hope they're recovering. Yes, but it's not going to be as good. So do I still refer? You do. So if you have a patient with herbs patient and they recover their biceps at three months, great, wonderful. Keep following them, they're gonna do great. But should you still refer them? Are you missing something? You are. And I've alluded to it a couple of times and we're gonna talk about this right now is this glenohumeral dysplasia because I think this is something that everybody is missing. So there's an imbalance theory here on glenohumeral dysplasia. So what we have right now is the, the, the shoulder is like a golf ball on a tee, okay? The humeral head's the golf ball, the tee is the glenoid, and we're balanced by the, post, by the rotator cuff muscles and the internal external rotators, okay? So we have our internal rotators there on the left-hand side, our external rotators there on the right-hand side, and, and we're in balance. And what happens is when we lose our external rotation, right, we fall out of balance and we fall into internal rotation. And common imbalance theory is then that that shifts the, the, the golf ball off the tee and I have subluxation and dislocation, and, and that is the etiology of my dysplasia. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, basic science studies have shown that if you just cut the suprascapular nerve, you get an internal rotation contracture and subscap atrophy. So what's going on? Well, we used to think it was just an imbalance of forces, but in reality, not only is it an imbalance of forces leading to that posterior translation of the head on the glenoid, right? We're shifting off that golf tee. But when the muscle's denervated, it doesn't keep up with skeletal growth. And that results in a tight rotator cuff leading to even more dysplasia. So in reality, what we're following is the hoiter volkman law, which orthopedic surgeons know well for how bone remodels and heals across the body. But people forget when you're applying it to the these babies, because compression inhibits growth and tensile forces stimulates growth. So normally, right, when we're in balance here, we're getting circular growth of the humeral head because we've got compression and tensile forces in balance. But when that's not in balance, when we have too much in the posterior pulling me into internal rotation and I can't externally rotate it. I start to get that subluxation of my golf ball on the golf tee. And then because I have differences in compression and tensile forces, I start to get dysplasia of my glenoid and of my humeral head. 
and I end up with a dysplastic shoulder. So that now what's happened is even if I get recovery, because the rotation, the axis of rotation has now changed, even if my herbs recovers, and I want this to be very important, because I have developed dysplasia, my external rotators have now become internal rotators. My supraspinatus is now an internal rotator. So yeah, you've achieved neurological recovery, but these kids don't have normal shoulders anymore and nor will they. So they're gonna lose and have inhibited abduction adduction. They're gonna have problems with rotation. They're gonna have tight deltoids, teres minors, intraspinatus, et cetera. You might see them scapular winging. Why? It's compensatory. They scapular wing so that they can function. It's their functional compensation. It's a cosmetic problem, but it shouldn't be fixed because they need that to function. In fact, you see glenohumeral motion decreased with increased scapular motion. So what do you do for these kids? Well, they need tendon transfers. So typically what I'll do is I'll do what's called a modified Hoffer procedure and I'll transfer the latissimus dorsi and the teres to the infraspinatus to try and rebalance their shoulder. So release one or both of those tendons you can see here. It's usually a conjoint tendon though, actually between them. And then reroute it over the triceps to the infra and supraspinatus footprint. And this is through an axillary approach. And the results here, you can see this kid can't abduct or externally rotate. You can see here, on the right, he's able to do both. So tendon transfers to prevent glenohumeral dysplasia. Yesterday and in the past, we thought, okay, this is, this is improving abduction external rotation by improving their motion and preventing dysplasia. It's not doing that. It's not changing their dysplasia, okay? Nerve work changes their dysplasia. What we're changing is we're changing their arc of motion, but we're not augmenting it. What do I mean by that? Well, look at this. This kid can abduct and he can externally rotate, but what can't he do? He can't internally rotate anymore. There's a cost. And you never wanna lose midline touch. Why is that? Well, what would you rather do? Would you rather externally rotate your arm and reach out in space for something, or would you rather pull up your pants and wipe your butt? So if they can't internally rotate and achieve midline touch, that puts them in a, and I, I don't often, uh, this is the modified Malay classification, which is more appropriate for children over the age of four. Um, but you see a, a grade one is horrible and a grade two is not much better. Grade five is normal. So if you lose midline function, midline touch, you're a grade two. It's a significant loss of ADLs. And, <clears throat> If C7 becomes involved, the likelihood you're going to lose midline touch, regardless of whether you do surgery or not, is actually pretty high. So what are the indications then for tendon transfer? Well, if they've lost their superior posterior rotator cuff function, tendon transfer, they also need to have deltoid working. And they need to have C7 function, or they risk losing that midline function. And why is that? Well, it's because the subscap is segmentally innervated. And you end up with this problem here, where up to 30% of those kids then lose midline touch. If they're older than that, you don't even bother at the glenoid. You go to a humeral osteotomy and you rotate them at the humerus to try and improve things. It improves their external rotation function, but it doesn't improve their abduction like the uh, Hoffer transfer does for the younger children. And do we see these in adults? Yeah, these are the people that get shoulder replacements when they're adults. So don't think that just because they recovered their function by three months that they're done and they're free and clear for their life, they're not. These are the people that have glenohumeral arthritis. I want you to look at this, this classification in the middle. This is called the Walsh classification of uh, glenohumeral arthritis. And the A and B when, uh, ones, those types A1 and A2, Look at the concentric uh, fact of that joint, the concentric humeral head on the glenoid. But then look below that at the B type and the C type. What's that? Those are dysplastic glenoids. And this is not related to plexopathy classification. This is a classification of shoulder arthritis that's used. 
this type one, B1, B2, and C, those are all dysplastic glenoids. And they didn't happen from wear and tear. Those happened because of herbs and extended herbs palsies. And the incidence of them is great in all comers for shoulder, arthro shoulder replacement, right? Over 50% of them are dysplastic. That's an astonishing number. This problem at birth follows them their whole life. So the misnomer of complete recovery is just that. It's a misnomer, it's a falsehood. They don't fully recover. And the ones that do are rare. And even if they do, they may have already started to develop their dysplasia and they need to be watched and they need to be checked. So early referral is important. Driving the surgical indications by biceps function is critical because it's not elbow flexion that matters, it's biceps function that matters. Operating early can prevent glenohumeral dysplasia. There's no role for brachial plexus MRI or electrodiagnostic studies in infants. There's massive intraoperative decision-making that has to take care of. And even if there's neurological recovery, there can still be dysplasia and it can still haunt these children into adulthood. Thank you so much. I hope this was um, enlightening. And, um, and I, I, I welcome any questions and, and happy to, to, to entertain them. Um, Devraj, can I go ahead? Yes, Dr. Giri. Okay. First of all, foremost, I want to thank you for a wonderful, detailed presentation. We pediatric neurologists have struggled with this uh, for all our professional lives. And now there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I wish you a long, successful career in helping all these babies. And you can bet we will definitely try and keep you at our institution by keeping you busy. Thank you for your kind words. Um, I have a question. Uh, I, yeah. I may have missed it, but uh, what do you look exactly at three, four months? Uh, what kind of function uh, lets you say that this, the baby will not need to be intervened on exactly what kind of level so if if they are a a c5 c6 so if they're in herbs or extended herbs then you're looking for biceps function so you want to see if they have biceps recovery by two to three months Remember I talked about two months being an important time frame um, with, with regards to remyelination. That, that is when you may not have so much axonomy, right? Like why do, why do we get this recovery at two to three months? Why is that an important time frame? Well, that's the time frame to allow for remyelination. So, you know, I spec talked about the spectrum of injury. We're not talking about recovery from axotomy. It's not going to happen by then. And recovery of axotomy is, is not enough to provide for muscle function to prevent glenohumeral dysplasia in the future. That's important to understand because you're going to get synaptic sprouting adjacently. So by four to five months, if you say, oh, my biceps is back, it's back because of the adjacent axons that are intact, right? It's back because of that. It's not back because of the axotomy that occurred. And so what will happen is they're gonna go down that dysplastic route. And then as adults, they're gonna need shoulder replacements. So if the biceps, however, recovers by two to three months, then you know that it was more the fact that it was a demyelination event They've remated, it's not an axotomy. And so they're gonna have a better recovery and they're gonna have a recovery equal to what surgery would offer them. 
from a from a, a, um, a neurological standpoint. They may still have a little bit of dysplasia, and it's important to watch that, right? So it's, you saw that ultrasound of a three-month-old that had a dysplastic shoulder. It's important to watch it. But usually, if they have recovery by then, they actually don't develop dysplasia. Um, and that's, that's what we see with, with early nerve surgery, too, is it's preventative. Thank you. Hi, good morning. This is Dr. Chari. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for a passionate talk. And you bet that you're going to have a lot more referrals. <laughs> so let us know where do you refer the patients? You're going to have a lot of kids between three and six months coming to you shortly at this rate. Good. Good. So, <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, so I, I, I um, actually, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just reshare my, my, um, my screen there. Um, I, I, the, the, my email, so a lot of people may not check their email. I check my email. I, I hand it out to my patients all the time. It goes straight to my cell phone. I often read it. Um, I'm happy to, to, um, to always check. Um, and, and I'm open to talking always. I'm very accessible. Um, I'll even actually add up on there. So you guys have it. Um, Okay. Can I edit this at the same time? Absolutely. Thank you so um, much. Let me put my cell phone number in there for you guys. So you can always text me too. I just put that in the chat. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm always happy to talk about things and even just talk about a case in general, like saying like, should I refer? Should I hold on to this kid a little longer? Um, that's, a, that's a reasonable discussion to have, right? You know, sometimes you can. Sometimes it can say, hey, you know what? watch them another month. Let's see what happens. Um, but six months is too late. Right. And even if they do I recover, know you, had a difficult patient. you know, even I was gonna say, even if they do recover, remember, we still got to check the shoulders. Right. I think you had a tough patient uh, recently who had been kind of missed out due to different reasons and you probably struggled a lot with that patient. And I think we yeah. failed the patient to a great extent. Yeah, um, I will say, however, I, I, did recently, um, I did recently see him and um, he, mm -hmm. he has um, some elbow flexion coming back and some external shoulder rotation. And um, we did get a, uh, a, a recent follow-up uh, ultrasound of his uh, glenohumeral joint and his um, dysplasia has not progressed. So um, that's good. I usually don't do the tendon transfers on the kids till they're about two. So um, we have about, a, you know, another uh, six, eight months of watching him um, to see if that's something that we may need or may not need, but it, it'll probably be something that's necessary for him considering he does have some minor dysplasia there right now. Thank you very much. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm happy to entertain any other questions or thoughts. If you want to talk to me offline, I, like I said, very accessible. I'll put my email in there as well for you guys. Um, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. I just had a quick question. Uh, so what is the best age that you want to see them before? Is it like two months old that you want uh, the kids to be evaluated before? So if they have a flail arm with a Horner syndrome, I want to see them when they're a month old or before. They need surgery when they're six weeks old. Okay. If they're flail arm with the Horners, they need surgery at six weeks old. If they have a flail arm, the earlier you get them to me, the better, because they really should have surgery before three months. And if their biceps has not recovered, their biceps, not shoulder flex, not elbow flexion, okay? I'm, I'm specifically talking about the biceps function. If their biceps has not recovered by two, three months, they're going to need nerve surgery. And even if it has recovered, I don't need to see them then at three months. Let's say their biceps recovered 
and they're actually doing really well. I do need to see them, you know, uh, probably before they're a year old because we need to evaluate them for dysplasia. Okay, let's say they, let's say you have an herbs, their biceps comes back at two months, they start doing really, really well. They still need a shoulder ultrasound at about a year old to see if they're dysplastic because they might still need a tendon transfer. They're not out of the woods yet. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 50% of all shoulder arthroplasty in this country and actually in the world happening because of dysplastic shoulders. Those are big numbers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kohler. I guess kind of our practice is going to change a lot now, <laughs> uh, especially all this uh, shoulder stuff. We didn't, didn't even like know before, or maybe we kind of overlooked that things. And yeah, yeah. I think <clears throat> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, like I said, I, I'm, I'm extremely accessible. I'm happy to talk offline anytime text me, call me, email me. Um, uh, and uh, if you don't hear back from me immediately, you will. I'm just in the operating room. <laughs> Thank you so much. I guess people loved your lecture. Uh, a lot of comments, sir. And uh, well, I'm sure we're going to refer so many kids to you. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for your time this morning. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.